I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby here with Alexander Daddario, one of the stars of The White Lotus. And playing Rachel, um, did you feel like you understood just who she was from the start when you were first reading the scripts? Um, I think it starts to formulate. So I have a whole process. I try not to put too much pressure on what comes. So you do, a t I do like a ton of um, just work reading the script over and over and over and the relationships between the characters and all of that. And then, and then it's, it's really kind of amazing. Once you've done all the work, you sort of discover things that maybe you didn't consciously think of. Um, so it's a little bit of a combination of both. So I knew at her core who she was, there was a huge revelation I had. I always sort of thought, and this is why I don't like to really make like a concrete decision about everything. Um, that she was really, I sort of thought, oh, well, she's really unhappy and doesn't want to be here. And she doesn't like anything about this. She's, she's just trying to make it all work and good and be good. And um, there were moments where I realized she does, she likes the money and she likes the fancy purse and the, and the clothes. And there was a reason that she got herself into this situation that had more to do with just sort of being swept away. Yeah, definitely. I did want to just automatically just dig into that relationship that she has with Shane, which I would say is quite toxic. And there's very little good about this relationship, at least from what we see, you know, visibly on the show. But I'm curious if you could speak more to what it actually was, if there if it was beyond the sort of status with Shane that kind of attracted her to him in the first place. Yeah, I mean, well, she says it, it's in Mike's writing. Um, mm -hmm. I think that she's not lying when she says, you know, you were so cute. And and I think that there's, I don't think she's ever dated anyone like him before. And I think the sort of sloppy attempts to sweep this woman off her feet, you know, she's a pretty girl, she has a decent career, especially in her 20s. Um, I think that they all paled in comparison to what Shane was able to do. Um, so I think that that was romantic in a way. And there was that part of, you know, being picked up in a black car and going off to a fancy restaurant and going out to the Hamptons that um, she had never really done before and that she kind of liked. And he, he was being charming um, and he's cute. And I think that you know, he was nice to her because he's not like he's he's a bad person in a lot of ways. But aren't we all, I guess. But he um, I don't think that that came out at first. I think she probably saw him maybe being rude to other people, but not to her, mm -hmm. which is always a sign. And she probably ignored it for a long time. Yeah, I, I would I would think so. Yeah. Well, because so many of your scenes are with Jake Lacey. Um, I'm wondering what dynamic you formed there and especially to have most of your scenes have this kind of hostile tone where I feel like there's not a lot of moments that you're on the same page basically. Like what is that dynamic with the two of you? It was actually a really interesting dynamic. Um, it was both feeling, um, we really like each other. I think, I mean, I can't speak for him, but um, we shared a lot of really personal things with each other, but in a non-intimate way, if that makes sense. So I think actors love to share personal things about themselves. Um, we love to talk about ourselves. And I think also when you're diving into a character being working together, especially in the kind of situation we were in where we were trapped together, um, due to quarantine. Um, we got close in that way where we got to know parts of each other. Um, and, and, and that, that I think can be really helpful to have an understanding of the person beyond just when you come to set and, you know, do whatever, but we had a really, really wonderful relationship. It was a great working relationship. We got to know each other. 
And, and then there was, and I think this was sort of true of the entire cast, a very supportive relationship. Um, and I felt that from Jake, but I felt that from everyone. Um, like my dog died while I was there. And, you know, there were always people calling and making sure that I had someone to have dinner with. And it's not like you become best friends and go move in with each other afterwards, but just this really sort of sense of family and taking care of each other. And we really had that. And I, I do feel I had that with Jake. So I'm very appreciative. He was, he was a great guy. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about that. Yes, well, that, that was a shame, but I think it actually was sort of one of the things that made the show special was the, the circumstance mm. we were in. Yeah, well, I did just want to touch on that since you talked about it, this incredible cast, you know, Connie Britton, Jennifer Coolidge, Steve Zahn, Murray Bartlett, Molly Shannon, like some real true greats in this cast. Um, how much of a learning experience was it for you just to sort of be in their company for a few months? Well, I learned that I'm, you know, not that funny. I think that it's like, it's, it's, it's so amazing to um, watch what Jennifer and Molly and all these people do. It, it shows you how difficult it is. I mean, just to speak on Jennifer, she, what she does is, and it's all, I mean, she's a very sweet, wonderful, deep person, but the way she delivers a line and the thing she said, even when you're having a casual conversation, it's so astounding um, how funny she is and it feels effortless. Um, and that was really amazing to be around, to basically be quarantined with comedy legends and, um, and see how they are in a, in a, in just socially. I mean, they, they're just funny. They're just amazing, amazing, amazing talents. Um, and I, I mean, again, it was just a supportive environment, but yeah, I, how do you explain being quarantined with Jennifer Coolidge, Molly Shannon, Murray, all these people and we went down to the beach every night and watched the sunset and we all supported each other and we were all, it all felt so collaborative and like we were all equals and all part of this experience and um, with no ego and that, that, you know, it's Hollywood that doesn't always happen. And that was a really special, really special thing. So you felt like you were on the same page as everybody else in a, in a weird way. Yeah. And it doesn't hurt to, to be where you were in Hawaii Yes. <laughs> with all this. Um, well, another interesting part with Rachel is this anxiety that she has about her job, where she's basically a, a listicle writer, but she has these other ambitions for herself just as a, as a journalist. But now she's in this position where she doesn't really have to even work anymore, that she can sort of just be a trophy wife. Um, so how did you find your way into that sort of internal struggle that she's having where this really feels like she's sort of at a crossroads and she has to make a decision on who she wants to be and like what she wants to do? Did you draw on anything there? Well, I imagined that what would it be if I had could was in that position, which I think, you know, for me, it, it was a feasible thing. Um, maybe not now, but at some point in my life, um, I love acting. I'm obsessed with it. I'm obsessed with the craft of acting and the whole thing, but there've certainly been times in my career where that just was not it, it, the, my, the perception and the kind of work I was doing was not, you know, of the, the kind of standard that was getting me the kind of work I wanted to do and the whole thing. But I still loved what I did. That's not to say I don't have appreciation for what I was doing, but um, there certainly could have been a time when that just all dried up and just the choices I made just started to push me into a place where I would begin doing work that I really couldn't tolerate. Um, and of course I could have met some guy and, you know, and just got, and what would that have felt like? Um, and I think that 
it's a little bit different, but imagining that sort of feeling of helplessness and that's the problem for Rachel. You know, she's stuck in, I want my life to be different, but I've sort of followed what the best that I can do right now. And I don't think she's that great at her job or she at least hasn't made the decisions and the choices in her work that have brought her to the next level or to the place that in her mind she feels she should be. Um, and so she's sort of stuck by, well, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm a cute girl. Um, men find me appealing. I have a career I can talk about, but it's not really something I'm proud of. And, you know, for her taking the money and being the, the, the wife and having kids and she can still work, you know, but she just, she's, she's not happy with their choices, but she made them for a reason. And I think that's where her hypocrisy comes in, where she goes, I'm better than this. And I, I need to be a better woman and I need to be, you know, and I'm, I'm more than just what I look like. And I'm more than just the, the, the money that my husband has, but she put herself in that situation. So she's at war with herself and, um, and I just put myself in that situation. If I had been there, the frustration or the, the sense of loss of my career, I, I, didn't, I didn't succeed at my career. This wasn't what I wanted. I, I never found the kind of accolades or the kind of joy from my work that I, that I wanted. And that's a painful feeling for anyone. Yeah. And especially to also have these other characters, actually like older women characters, like Connie Britton's character, who she wrote this listicle about, which she just says is, was a hatchet job. And it kind of just breaks her spirit basically to hear that. And then Molly Shannon, you know, playing the mother-in-law and really just disrupting this vacation. You know, it's not just Shane that she's having these sort of conflicts with. And I'm just kind of wondering going back to just the conflict with Shane and everything. How much does that weigh on you when there is so much negative energy that your character is going through in almost every scene? How does the, how much does the relationship, the fact that he's not listening, you mean? Well, just the sense that like almost a lot of the scenes in the show, you're, you're dealing with a lot of interpersonal conflict that is very tense and hostile. And just for you, I'm wondering like what, what that does to you personally. Well, it's horrible. And I certainly, I think we've all been in relationships like that. I know I was in one in particular that I drew from where literally nothing that I felt was allowed. It was, you know, it was overwhelming to the other person and, and um, that's not how things should be. And Shane's a little bit like that. And I think that, that the feeling of being, your feelings aren't valid. It's almost like the silent treatment. Cause it's like, you say how you feel about something, but the way that, that the, the way you're expressing yourself or the thing that's bothering you is interfering with my way of living you know, and, and, and my enjoyment on this vacation. So then I, at Rachel, my care, I just have to sort of sit back and feel all these feelings of not only my own dissatisfaction with what we just talked about the career and where I am at in my own life, which maybe she'd be okay if she had sort of a solid relationship with Shane. I think a lot of it comes from that, but she also has to deal with the fact that she's pushing down all of her very valid feelings um, and they're being, they're all being invalidated and she just has to sit there holding on to that. And that's in my experience, very painful and you don't feel heard. And then you're like, Oh my God, this is my family. Now this is my husband. And I can't, even if I, and we all become irrational too at times. So even if she's being irrational, she is now not able to differentiate between a rational emotion and an irrational one. And it's all grouped together and it's all bad. And she can't express the rational feelings and it's all being pushed down. And, you know, as a woman, I know I, you sort of like, okay, well then I'll make everything better and I'll make everything great, but that doesn't last. Eventually you're gonna explode or express yourself or in her case, leave 
which she never had an intention of, you know, following up on. But. Yeah, well, I did want to touch on that, which I'm sure plenty of people have already asked you about or talked to you about, which is her decision in the end to, um, even after saying she regrets marrying him, she decides to go back and, and stay with him in the end. Uh, I'm curious just what your reaction was when you realized that that was ultimately ultimately going to be her choice and how you sort of rationalized that decision. So funny because I I was actually surprised by the um, the internet reactions to like, oh my God, you I can't believe that she stayed. I think in my mind, it, A, I think I just trusted Mike implicitly. I just loved working with him and I loved, I love his work. And I, I sort of just knew that was her story. Um, But I also, she was never going to leave. I don't, where is she going to go? I think that in her mind, I think like her saying, I'm going to leave. And I'm, I, you know, is a, is a, an attempt at, at expressing herself. It's an attempt. I think that if he had had a different reaction, which of course he wasn't going to, but if he had had a different reaction where he had said, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're feeling this way. Please don't leave. I'll make some adjustments. Then I think she would have stayed in a second. I think that she was almost just trying to figure out a way out of this incredible mess of feelings she was having. And um, I don't think that she's ready to leave him yet. I, again, I do think she likes the money and the privilege and the safety that he provides her. I don't think that she feels safe on her own in her thirties um, in a career she doesn't sort of like because it's not bringing her where she wants to go. And when you're in your thirties and you, you're realizing, oh my gosh, that's when you start to panic um, because you're like, I'm supposed to be at a certain place by 40. And I need to have the steps on the ladder in my thirties and I'm not near the steps I'm supposed to be. So I don't think she ever really intended on leaving because he provides her with a certain sense of, at least to the outside world, marriage, kids, money, some degree of success. She's, She's allowing other people's perception to drive her own perception of herself. Yeah, I I think that's exactly right. And I'm curious if you've also thought about what is the future for them? Like, where do they go from here? I think she leaves him eventually, but I think- But when when is that? I think it's a few years down the road. She may even have a kid. She signed the prenup. So I think she actually (laughs) thinks about that, what she's getting, how she can sort of and I, again, I, I think it's more like strategic, like, I think she's, I, I think she's an emotional person. I don't think she's that calculated. I think she's just like, what do I do to be safe? So like a lot of us, um, but I do think eventually with the diamonds on her fingers, you know, she just like, is like, that's it. I'm leaving one day. Um, but I do think it takes her a little while. I mean, I've, I've thought of both, like, is it two years or is it 10? Um, but I think at a certain point, she can't really put up with it. There's always the idea that maybe she becomes Molly Shannon, like she becomes that and sort of, but I don't think she's that kind of girl. I didn't play her like that. I don't want her to be that kind of girl, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like your, your narrative for how, how her journey continues personally. Yeah. Well, for those of you watching, subscribe for more interviews and go to goldderby.com to make your Emmy predictions. Uh, Thanks so much, Alex. Thank you so much. 